Spice up a wine, part two. All right, so to rack. Well, really, really simple. We like to use an auto siphon, but if you don't have an auto siphon, but you do have some tubing, you can still do it. It's just a little bit more... Tricky. Yeah, that. I would not suggest pouring it from one vessel to another, simply because oxygenation can be very bad for your brew. However, the gist of it is, end goes into the destination vessel, and the this end goes into your source vessel. Now, I left the cap on, that guy right there, on purpose, because I know there's some leaves in the bottom here that I don't want going into my destination. This is just the first racking, so it's not super critical, but, you know, keep it as clean as you can. Once you get it going, I usually just let it drop to the bottom carefully and not move it again. That's the trick, because if you move it, you can stir up the lees. You're gonna get a little bit in there, but that's how you get the most product, too. You wanna make sure you try to get everything in there. Um, we get a lot of people that ask, can I coffee filter this and things like that? Well, you can. It's not necessarily the greatest idea. You can get some oxygenation in there. It's also exposed to the air longer when you do that. So that just concerns me a little bit. The tried and true method just seems to work really, really well. All right, so a lot of people ask, how much waste is there? If you look at this, there's barely anything in there. I mean, it went all the way to the bottom, no problem. The spices didn't make it into the brew and everything's looking pretty clean. So what yeast did we use on this? This was Red Star Premier Classique. So there's something about this particular yeast that I've noticed that I would like to point out, and that is flocculation, which means it settled out and compacted nicely in the bottom. Yeah, you can see creating it. Looks like peanut butter. a nice compact yeast cake, and that makes the, the transfer, the racking, process. the racking process, a lot easier, because you don't get a bunch of the lease coming up into your, your racking. So, yay, Premier. All right, putting an airlock back on this, because this is just secondary fermentation, which is kind of a weird misnomer thing to me. That's why we call this the conditioning phase, because it's really just sitting for a while. We're gonna hope it settles out. If there's any last little bits of fermentation, they might finish off, but this is pretty much done. And we're hoping it clears, we're hoping that it degasses itself a bit, but just to help it along, I'm gonna give this a good swirl. You can see that airlock going crazy, and I'm OCD, I like my airlock that way. I don't know why. But you see how crazy that's going? That's a good thing. I want to get some of those gases out because they add off smells, sometimes off flavors. They're just fermentation gases, not necessarily the nicest things. Anyway, I'm gonna continue shaking this and we're gonna let this sit for a couple of weeks, see if it clears out and we'll be back with you then. Okay, so it's been like another week and a half or so and I've been watching this. I don't think it's gonna clear anymore. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I know a lot of people in the comments are gonna say, oh, you could've used this or you could've used that. You could've used all the... Yes, you absolutely can use any clearing agent that you decide you want to do. To me, this is clear enough. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't change the flavor. And honestly, if I serve this to somebody and they turn their nose up at it, that's the last time I'd offer them one of my brews. It's just that simple. Homebrew is not perfect. And I see a lot of cloudy ciders and beers and wines out there commercially made on purpose that way. So I did it on purpose. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Well, besides that, many of the um, clearing agents that you can get to get a clearer brew actually strip some of the flavors out. And since there's some debate on that. There's some, some debate. Some people say that it doesn't. Some people say that it sure. does. There's been no scientific study to prove that it does or doesn't. I'm going with if you remove stuff, you got to be taking something away. So to me, it's a little bit of common sense. Is it a detectable amount? That is the real question. But since flavor is king here, we're not going to worry about the clarity so much and preface keeping as much flavor in there as we can. Exactly. So what are we going to do right now? We are going to rack this and we're going to use an auto siphon just like we always do. I am going to take the cap off the end though because there's just a tiny little bit of wispy lees at the bottom here. And we're just going to put it into our pitcher with the raised numbers on the side that more and more people are starting to get and understand why I get so excited about it. All right. So according to our pitcher with the raised numbers, 
we have about 114 or so ounces, which is a little bit less than a full gallon. So we have four full 750 ml wine bottles and then one like beer bottle, it's like a 16 ounce Grosch bottle. But one thing that I want to do on this, because it is very dry, is 1.002. By the way, this is 14.3% alcohol. If you don't know how I calculated that, I took the original gravity minus the final gravity, which was 1.108 minus 1.002, and I multiplied that result by 135. Some people use different numbers. If you're curious why I use 135, we have a video on that too. Anyway. That comes to 14.3% alcohol, which is pretty respectable. It's a little higher than what the yeast should probably do, which is interesting, but I do want to get a little taste of this. Just happened to have a glass at arm's reach. And I'm going to do this on purpose because before you bottle something, you want to know that it is finished the way you want it. So if it's too dry or lacks something, you want to be able to fix that. By the way, anybody that really worries about the clarity, this is actually not bad. It's got a little tiny bit of a haze is all. On the nose, it's like pure spices. Get on, getting all those spices, which is, that oh. was the idea. It's pure spices. It actually smells real good. Yeah, go ahead and give that a taste. What we're doing is checking for the balance. Oh, apparently she likes it. Mmm. For as dry as that went. Wow, that it actually tastes sweet. Um, okay, my initial assessment is this does not need back sweetening, does not need anything else, which is cool because if we back sweeten, now we have to find a way to stabilize that. And our preferred way is pasteurization, which takes some time. We do have videos on pasteurization if you wanted to know how to do it. But uh, I think we're good to bottle as is. That's pretty cool. That's that's awesome. Actually, we'll be let's bottle. Ta-da! All of our bottling equipment has been sanitized and is ready to go. So the first thing we need to do is apply our bottling wand to the end of our auto siphon tube. If you don't know what a bottling wand is, it's normally a wand that you use for bottling. Anyway, <laughs> it is usually solid that you attach one end to the hose, like so, only about half inch in, or otherwise it's hard to get back out. On the end, though, it has a springy thingy, also known as a stem valve. Now, some of them have springs. Some of them are just from friction, gravity, whatever. I like the spring one. I had the other one for years. They leak. Okay, this one really doesn't leak. You might get a drop. If you don't have one of these, you can use the clamp on the hose. You can kink the hose. There's a lot of ways to do it. I found this to be the most efficient and most effective because it doesn't actually waste anything like maybe a couple of drops and that's about it so just like with racking with bottling we're going to have our destination bottles lower than our pitcher source source that's the word <laughs> and you put put the auto siphon in you depress yeah. the bottling wand make sure you push that down Otherwise, you're just going to get a lot of air in there and you'll be very unhappy and probably use words that I can't use on YouTube. If you wanted to know how to do this one-handed, <laughs> that's how you do it one-handed. So we ended up with four bottles and this last little 16-ounce Grolsch is up to about there. But this will be our taster. Now, what we're going to do with these bottles is one of them, probably one of these three because they have the better caps, will go away for a year and we'll do a tasting on that in a year to see how much it improves. The others, this is good. It's probably not going to last very long. <laughs> yeah, I can see it already. It's also quite dry, which means I can drink this without feeling too guilty because there's not a lot of sugars in it, therefore not a lot of carbs. <sighs> I'm a little shocked at this. But anyway, the, all that's left now is to give you guys the real idea on how this came out. So we're going to do the tasting. We're also going to label these. You don't need to see this label because our labeling is very fancy. Very fancy. Masking, Masking tape, tape and a and Sharpie. Sharpie. Okay, so when you make a brew, what's that one last piece of information that you need to know? How does it taste? Is it any good? I mean, you know, seriously. So here we go. So this is about um, five weeks old or so at this point. And it's 14.3% alcohol. We've had experience with apple in the past where it took a long time to taste good. We were really pleasantly surprised on the initial tastes of this. First off the bat, color is like odd. It's very pale. Yeah, it's like a champagne. Yeah, it looks more like champagne. 
It's got a little bit of a haze. Uh, clarity, zero through 10, I'd say this is about a four to a five. It's not super clear. Um, I mean, I can see my finger through it, you know, so it's oh, yeah. not yeah. like, it's not pea soup, okay? It's, it, it, it's not that bad, um, but it's not clear, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> the smell. It's very astringent and a little harsh on the smell. To me, and I think I've mentioned this multiple times, and I've noticed in the comments that people have a similar memory share, so cheers to you. It reminds me of spiced apple yogurt, and I really enjoyed spiced apple yogurt, and so that has that tang to the aroma, and okay. it's a happy place for me, so I, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm, I'm actually- I'm not saying it bothers me, I am describing it. Yes. Um, it's got the spices coming through in the aroma, without a doubt. But I'm but still getting apple. I'm not. I am. I really am not getting apple in the aroma. Okay, if I really try hard, it's there. It's not coming across as sweet. It's more like a green apple, though. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that's why it's not registering as apple to me, because oh, okay. spiced apple, like apple pie and things like that, they're supposed to be sweet. And that's what's the disconnect. It's not an unpleasant smell, though. It's, for, for its age, it's actually not unpleasant at all. On the taste, I would swear this is higher gravity than it is. This is a 1.002 final gravity, and this tastes like a 1.020. So I'm going to do the travel this time. Oh. Are you ready? Buckle your seatbelts, boys and girls, because here we go. This is our first tasting today, by the way. <laughs> first off, right off the bat, I am hit with juicy, sweet apple. Not tart mm -hmm. apple, sweet apple. And it's juicy and it's vibrant and you're just like, yeah. wow. And then the spices come rolling right in there. They're like, hey, we're gonna give you some apple pie time. Make you think about grandma and working in the kitchen and smelling the pie and so happy. And then you get a little bit of the bittery, astringy thing. It's not, it's not painful. It's not harsh. It's not even a bad thing. It's just a different thing. It's part of your journey. For science. It's, it's really lovely. The finish is clean. We have a little bit of the residual spiciness going on that's playing on oh. your tongue, but uh, it's not, incredibly long, but I think the most surprising part of the experience of this beverage is that upfront sweet juicy apple flavor. For something this low gravity, or this, not this low gravity, but this low ABV, meaning how little sh fermentable sugars are still in the beverage. How dry it is. You would expect it to be like real dry and not sweet at all. And that's not what it's telling me. I agree with 90% of what you said, except for me, the finish is a little longer. I actually get the spices lingering on the exhale long after, long after I've swallowed. The sweetness is gone by that point. Yeah. The sweetness kind of goes away two thirds through. Yep. Before it gets to the finish, it's gone. I am shocked by this one. <laughs> I expected it to be okay. I really did. I expected this is gonna be okay. Derricka wanted to make a spiced apple wine, and I thought, okay, sure, that sounds like a great idea. And I thought, it'll be something that she'll drink because it's probably not gonna be my yeah. thing. Yeah, we went into this with the expectation that this is an apple fermented beverage. Therefore, a year from now, we will enjoy it up front. We're yeah. gonna be like, ah, it's young. It's young, it's young. And we're gonna make a little icky, eh, it's young face. But, but if no. I didn't know this was five weeks old, I would never believe this was five weeks old. We've said this a lot, but this one actually really, wow, it, it it's shocking. It, Basically, it be this good. if you want to make an apple fermented beverage and you want to be able to drink it without having to age it, make this. Yeah, easily, I mean, you see how much I'm drinking of it, right? Yeah, I'm just drinking it like it's nobody's business because this is so good. And because it's so sweet up front, I just wanna come back to that. There's only this much left in the bottle. We gotta finish this. Top it off. 
course, yeah. we have more tastings to do, so. Yeah, we'll see if we do more. <laughs> yeah, this is 14.3%. I mean, you know, how much is really in one of these glasses? I don't know, five, six ounces. It's like a full glass of wine, maybe. I feel like a broken record is saying it's really good, but it's really good. The thing that's amazing is when you look at the trifecta, you take sweetness, acidity, and tannins into account. Now, some people have asked, what are tannins? Tan how do you describe tannins? Tannins are the thing that makes your mouth kind of pucker when you drink tea it, or it's, black it's coffee. It's like a drying sensation almost. Yeah, um, I, I liken it to sandpaper on your mouth when it's too much. Sure, sure. Tannins themselves are a great way to add body and richness and depth to a brew, okay? Sweetness can also add mouthfeel and depth more of a viscosity type right. thing. Right, and acidity can brighten something that's otherwise kind of dull and flat. And give the cleansing, clean feeling. Right, so when those three things are in balance, your body goes, you know, your brain just goes, ooh, I like this, this is good. This. This is like perfectly balanced. And is balanced. The, the really interesting thing about it is that it's not balanced at once. Yeah, it has all you the things. You have sweetness up front, mm -hmm. then you have dannins in the middle, and then you have that ending with the acid and the and the cleanliness. And you it's... know, you know what? I'm going to take all the credit for this because we were only going to put six allspice berries in, and at the last minute, I put eight. Yeah, see, that's what put it over the top. <laughs> Those extra two allspice berries made this perfect. <laughs> this, I don't know. this is so good. This is probably one of my top ten at this point. It's a methaglin without honey, okay? Which is what we kind of set out to do. It's not as sweet as my, my spice methaglin. So this is the Brerica wheelhouse. See what I did there? Mm -hmm. I did not coin that term, somebody no, else did. No, you didn't, it's been used before. Um, but it's got the methaglin notes that Brian really enjoys, and it's got the fruity notes that I really enjoy. Yeah, and the, the just enough sweetness to carry through both of them. It, yeah. It, it just really works. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Hate to keep going on and on and on. I mean, we could, but you probably don't want to watch that, so we're not gonna. So now, what is the time? It's time for numbers. Okay, I, I have a number. <laughs> Are you ready? I need a number, and then I'm like, wait, that's that's not right. Okay, uh, let me go through our scoring <laughs> system because I haven't done this in a while. It goes one through ten. Ten being. This is awesome. This is just fantastic. I would choose this above all others. We have done an 11. Just so you know, ours goes to 11. Only one thing has ever gotten an 11 and it was from both of us. We both gave an 11 without provocation. Anyway, one means it's disgusting. It's possibly toxic and you would definitely dump it out and you wouldn't even give it to your worst enemy. Between one and 10 is varying levels. For me, generally speaking, anything above like say a five is something that I would reach for voluntarily to drink. So that gives you an idea. That's how the scoring works and we change it from time to time because this is like the Drew Carey show, whose line is it anyway, where we make up the points and they just don't they matter. They just anymore. don't matter. All right, so I'm gonna stick with my initial number just because it's All right, I, that I'm, kind of day. I have my initial number. I have my final number too because it's, they're the same. Anyway, are you ready? I'm ready. One, two, three, nine point five. Ten point five. <laughs> Holy crap! Ten point five. <laughs> that's what popped in my head at first. I'm like, wait, this is not right. Wow. And then you said it went to eleven, so I'm sticking with ten point five. And do you want to know why I'm sticking with ten point five? Memories. All right. Hey, you know, I'm not gonna ever judge somebody, but that's amazing. That is the second highest score she's ever given. Yes, it is. This got the 10.5, and I know I'm just tromping all over you, because normally we let the oh, low fine. man on the scoring totem it's pole fine. go first. I like listening to her talk, so that's okay. But this, from the very beginning, nearly, from the, from the get-go, if you will, was reminding me of... <laughs> I broke them. Woohoo! It was reminding me of... 14% alcohol, by the way, folks. <laughs> Which you would think, oh, that's why Derek is that way. <clears throat> no. No. She was like this before we No. I wake up this way, people. I'm just a nut job. Anyway, so from the get-go, as I was saying, this was reminding me of spiced apple yogurt, yep. which has a fondness in my heart, if I have not conveyed that yet. 
we, we're kind of getting the impression. But then, in the final tasting, another memory trigger, baking apple pie with grandma. Oh, wow, okay. So now I have childhood mm -hmm. and sentimentality all combined in one beverage, which I know Brian is gonna appreciate because it's got the spice notes that he mm -hmm. loves, which makes me happy when he's happy. Plus it's got the fruity sweetness that makes me happy personally. So now I'm doubly happy and I got happy memories on top of that. So 10.5. Okay, I went 9.5 and here's why. As much as I wanted to give this a 10, it's not quite. It's so close. I think there's a couple of harsher sharp edges that need to be rounded more. I mean, when, you, when I start saying 10, I need to, it needs to be amazing, okay? 9.5 is really, really good. And this is, I think my, my scale slides. Like, as I get closer to 10, I get more and more picky, where you're like, 10.5, 9, yeah, it's all the same thing. <laughs> well, normally, that's not true, because normally, you're I'm usually like... usually way lower than I'm me. way lower, and that's but because... But I think your steps between are more finite, where mine are... Fluid, well, <laughs> I have sentimentality connected to oh, brews that we've already created, such as Klingon blood wine. Klingon blood wine is near and dear to my heart because that was just a let's put all the ingredients in a bucket mm. and see what happens. That one in Fay wine. And well, Fay wine was my my favorite train wreck where I wanted it to be perfect. And we should have named that one Kildare. It just yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, sorry. We'll it's, explain that story. It's a D&D &D thing. Um, but Klingon blood wine, it's just fantastic. And so... See, that's another one that she likes better than I do. I always think, well, is it is it Klingon blood wine good? <laughs> See? Okay. And so that's what keeps most of the beverages pushed down in the number train. Because I like, find it interesting, though, that this would be my spiced methaglin if there was honey in it. Yeah. Which yeah. you also gave your highest score sure. to ever. Sure, 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 sure. But because this this triggered the the double happy, happy memories, oh, I'm absolutely. just like, all right, it is it I is think, Klingon blood. I think it also holds the record for the most drank during the tasting. Yes. I don't think we've ever drank that much of one no, on a tasting I before. Like, it was really, really good. <laughs> um I'm I'm still a little bit like speechless as to what to say because Everything that I know, all my experience in brewing, says this should not be as good as it is. So yeah. is it just a fluke? Did we get lucky? It's possible. However, the only way to know is make this for yourself and sure. find out. Um, Which we I, highly accept, so suggest. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this this is really, really incredible. I do know that adding spices to almost anything in our palates improves it, okay? For the most part, when you add spices to things, yeah, it makes it taste better. The balance was just, just right this time. And sometimes it's a very fine line. I mean, maybe those two, I joke about the allspice berries, but maybe those two berries did make the difference. Who knows? Maybe without them, it wouldn't have been a tannic enough. Maybe with two more, it would have been, it wouldn't have tasted as sweet. There's all sorts of little things yeah. to it. And that's why we love to make these videos and, and test things out and go, ooh, this was our experience with it. Now, just keep in mind, if you live where we live, in the same environment that we live, and use the exact same ingredients at the exact same time of year, or with the exact same temperature in your house, you can hope to get an approximation of what we made. If you live in anything different, it will be different, okay? It might be better, but it will be different. We get people um, asking questions like, oh, I live somewhere cold. Well, if you live somewhere cold, you may want to choose a different yeast because you want something that can work in a colder environment. We're finding that a lot of the uh, Lauvin, like Lauvin 71B, was our favorite for a long, long time. We've gotten away from using it because a couple of people actually complained that we were using it all the time, but it worked that well that we used it. And we moved away from D47 because that wasn't so effective in our environment. And that's when we switched to 71B. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to find some of the red stars work really, really well in our environment. Now, when I say our environment, what I mean by that is we keep our house between 74 and 79 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm saying 74 now because it's summertime. I've been running the air conditioning a little bit more. Yeah. So 74 to 79. Now, the brew probably will never get down to 74 degrees because it's kept in a, in a closed area where there's really no drafts. And overnight, it's not going to drop 
that far, it's never gonna get to 74 degrees, the air temperature is 74. So it's probably staying in a constant 77 to 78 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is crucial because yeast tend to be more happy in a warmer environment and... But the war the, the, there's a caveat to that sure, though. If sure. it goes too warm, they start producing off flavors. Yes. If it's too cold, they can stall and they can also produce off flavors from the stress. So there's like a sweet spot and you have to find that sweet spot for your environment in brewing. And I know that sounds really weird and you've probably never heard anyone say that, but we deal with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of brewers all the time. And I'm seeing this kind of little niche happening for each person. And if you think about it, like in Belgium, when they make beers, each brewery has its own microcosm yeah. of environment that it's working in. And their beer tastes different from somebody that's just a mile away in a similar climate, but they're their own micro little thing that without that, their beer isn't their beer. So this sounds like a video that we need to do, and we're gonna address this topic specifically. Yeah, because this is getting way too long, one but it was an idea that's, come on. Video. So, empty glasses, empty bottle, make this brew. Yeah, scores are given. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day. Bye-bye.